Hello, everybody. This is Luis Galvez, Technical Marketing Manager at Walters Kluwer Tax and Accounting. And I'd like to welcome you to our live webinar today, Past, Present, and Future of Bank Products, a session we are excited to co-host with our bank partners, TPG, Reef and Advantage, EPS, and Republic Bank. Now, today's roundtable discussion will be hosted by Shannon Bond, VP and Segment Leader for Walters Kluwer Tax and Accounting. And joining her today are Eric King, VP of Strategic Alliances at TPG, Jermaine Shireen, VP of Sales at MetaBank Tax Division, and Carter Dempsey, VP and Director of Tax Refund Solution Sales at Republic Bank. So welcome, everybody. Let's talk about today's roundtable topics. We'll uh, talk about attracting and retaining clients with bank products. So if you're offering them today or if you're new to bank products, this is your section of the presentation to understand the value and look at the different ways in which you can use them to to grow your business we'll also look at serving the tax industry for 30 plus years that's bank products doing its job so shannon and the team will look at a long-term history of finding the right formula to fit you know the taxpayer needs as well as taxpayers then we'll look at summer readiness activities and then the need for early enrollment which is something that uh, you can benefit from, you know, every year. And for some reason, some of you are not doing it. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then towards the end of the presentation, we'll look at tax returns with refund transfers. And that is, we're going to do a live demonstration of what it looks like for you to actually open your tax return, uh, select a bank product, and how quickly you can get it out the door. Now, we asked you a question when we uh, submitted the registration. We wanted to know your bank product volume. And uh, this is who we have in the audience today. About 55% of you are doing between one and 299 bank products. 300 and plus bank products is 19% of you attending today. And then about 26% not currently offering bank products. So if my math is correct, we should have about 74% of the attendees doing bank products and then uh, the rest, you know, 26% not currently offering those solutions. That is in line with what we see from the prepared market, a good 75 to 74 to 26% split. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So when we look at bank, at bank products, just understanding a little bit about what is it? Um, how do they help you? How do they help taxpayers? And what kind of common objectives are there? relative to bank products. So I'll, I'll turn it over first, I think, to Jermaine. Can you give us a little background on our bank products 101? Sure. Thanks, Shannon, uh, so much, and Louise. Kind of a brief history of kind of how we got here. The uh, When we use the term bank product, uh, we're usually talking about a refund transfer. And a, a refund transfer did not necessarily start off as an independent product. It originally started off, if you'll remember back uh, 20, 30 years ago, there was the uh, refund advance loans and a refund transfer uh, is what happened when a refund advance loan was denied. You'd already told the IRS to send my uh, tax refund to this bank account. And it was the only way the bank had of getting you your tax refund uh, when the loan was not approved. Well, as time kind of went on, what eventually happened in the market was the refund transfer rather than just becoming a, a subsequent action of a failed attempt at a loan, it actually became a standalone product where offices started using the product as just a way to pay tax prep fees. So it's just another option. Hey, if you remember, you know, the IRS took the debt indicator away about 12, 13 years ago, somewhere around 2010, 12, somewhere around there. And so what happened from there was the the ERO realized that there was still a population of their customers that were not accustomed to paying for tax prep fees out of pocket. So that's what this product really became. So to simplify the whole thing, a refund transfer today is really just another way to pay your tax prep fees. And so how I would say it if you are an office who are not offering uh, bank products, right now your customers, you can uh, they can pay cash, they can pay check, they can pay by credit card, they can pay out of their refund, or you can bill them and they can pay you later. That's an option I don't even talk about anymore <laughs> because this is in 1940 and we, you know, our customers aren't Miss Mary's son where you could go to Miss Mary and say, ooh, your son owes me 300 bucks. Um, so that's really what a refund transfer is, really just a way 
Um, if we want to simplify it, it's really just an option for how the taxpayer is paying your tax preparation fees and how it physically processes is the uh, refund, instead of going directly to the consumer, will go to us, the banks, and we will then pay your, your tax prep fees out of the refund. We'll pay our fee for, uh, for processing the refund. If there's a software fee, we'll pay that as well. And the consumer gets the remaining amount and whatever disbursement they type they would like. If the customer has a bank account, we can deposit the funds directly to their account. Uh, if the customer doesn't, we can print them out a, a, you can print them out a check inside your office, or if they would like, we can give them a prepaid card as well. That was a lot. That was, that was, but it's a, fair to say the process is the same, but there are varietals of refund transfers out there and available from all of you here as the leading industry providers of this service. And it's important to know that you want to take a look at all of the varietals and understand what's right for you, for your tax office. Carter, you want to lend a little bit more of your insight in terms of what this can do from a revenue perspective for uh, for our tax pros? Right. So uh, along with remains kind of the uh, evolution of the industry, uh, there was a time where everybody just associated bank products with the loan in particular. And I think what people are increasingly realizing and in, from conversations that we have is if you even have one client that does not pay you uh, from the expectation of what used to be post-dated checks or I have such a close relationship with my clients that I'm sure they'll come back and pay me. Uh, that trust or loyalty isn't the same as what it used to be. There's a higher amount of turnover for offices, a greater amount of attrition for whatever reason from people circulating from either online or other businesses within their area. What a bank product or an RT is an effective vehicle to deliver is to ensure that you're paid for your work each time, assuming that funding takes place. Um, and there's a variety of things because you would think it's automatic. Well, if I if I do that, I expect to get paid. Well, something as simple as in you're in a state where state refunds are faster, I'm making sure that you attach a state along with the federal, oftentimes the state will fed, uh, fund where the Fed doesn't, and sometimes sooner. It may not be as large, but it still provides you the opportunity to be paid. It's also about people understanding their market for the area that they're in and what the average fee is being charged. You know, people sometimes go out there thinking, I can charge a $99 fee and I'm going to get all the business because my fee is less. And that's not necessarily the case. Being priced appropriately for your particular segment in your area is important and also pricing according to what you set to earn for the amount of clients you have. So if you assume that you had 150 clients last year and you're going to gain another 70, what does your price per return need to be, assuming the levels of complexity vary that to some extent? to earn what it is that you're setting out to earn. Am I maximizing the ancillary products and the possible add-ons as well? Incentives aside, uh, that is not really where you should count your revenue for clients. It, it can be a benefit. It's about are you priced accordingly and are you utilizing the tools uh, available to you to ensure you get paid? Uh, we talk with many clients that don't do bank products that may have had an issue because of the term row back in the day, and I don't do row. And then you ask them, well, how much do you have in your accounts receivable? You know, clients didn't fund, 10 to 15,000. You know, by electing a bank product, you could ensure that if they fund, that you will get paid. So it, it's about growing your, your footprint, uh, being available to more people, but also getting paid on the people that you prepare the returns for. I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. It just doesn't fly into me. No, and I mean, if you look at the immediacy and the kind of um, right now mentality of the Gen Xers and the millennials out there, they want everything quickly. So when you think about the application of these services, it really is, in fact, a one-stop efficient play, which I think lends nicely into what I believe Eric's going to comment on, is while there's revenue opportunity, there's also a reduction in office costs and a play in, in efficiencies. Eric, over to you. Certainly. And first of all, thank you again for, for having us on here on this panel. It's, it's great to, to be able to share some of the insight with, uh, with the folks listening in. But uh, the refund transfer is, is great for convenience for the taxpayer as well as for the ERO. 
Uh, but to your point, you can you can reduce costs. You don't have to have a team of folks in your office that are processing accounts receivables and processing uh, payments coming through the mail and that sort of thing. It's very uh, seamless and in line with uh, the CCH software. Uh, it makes it very easy. Also, whenever you sign on with a bank partner, you're also not only getting the service of the refund transfer, you're also getting help with your marketing. Uh, we provide marketing materials. You don't have to have uh, a team of folks or a, a separate third party assistance for your marketing. We, we all provide really uh, good and compelling marketing that'll help you attract clients. Um, even things as simple as having a, a banner or sign outside of your office showing that you know there's no upfront fees for, for processing their tax return. You know, things like that will attract new clients, uh, help replace uh, any of the any attrition you might have uh, and just help you grow. So it's going to recruit, reduce your costs and, and uh, also be a benefit that might be able to pull more people into your office. Yeah, and I think one other point there is one thing I think people need to think about is you may not have 100 clients that want bank, bank products. You may not have 50, but you may have a few. And it doesn't cost anything to enroll, to have it available. Maybe you have those, those few clients that are difficult, don't have the ability to pay or you have trouble tracking down to get them to pay. It's a nice option to have available. There are, like I said, a lot of varieties of uh, solutions out there and it just allows, we know not every tax office is the same. No two are exactly alike. We're all struggling in the, in the digital age of trying to capture eyeballs, if you will, or get that attention. You want to have those things that differentiate you or that can serve the broadest audience possible. So you can think about it as I can enroll. If I don't use it, it doesn't matter. You're No one's going to charge you for anything. You just have it available as needed. You know, Shannon, I think that uh, I think that that's if, if I were to ask a a user, a, a tax wise user or a tax office that doesn't do bank products to get anything out of, you know, any of us, that would be the thing It's that mm -hmm. this may or may not be your core customer. But guess what? To enroll with us cost you absolutely nothing but the seven minutes that it took you to enroll with us. And if you enroll with us and you get approved and you don't do any, no harm, no foul. But if you do have a customer that needs this, j just think about it. Some customers walk in and say, hey, you know what? You can e-file it on Friday once I get paid. I'll come in and pay you, you know, and then you can e-file it for that customer and that you may or may not have. This will be an option that you now are already prepared for rather than uh, have to figure things out. Yeah, absolutely. And I know we have this a little further in the deck, but I would just say that since we were talking about marketing and, and capturing eyeballs, it's with the, the TaxWise mobile tool, you're then able to have a complete end-to-end -end solution. Or if you do have that person who just can't get into the office or you just want to complete the return and not make a return trip, you can do all that through mobile and get paid. Let's go ahead and launch our first polling question as we're hoping to get to know our audience. And, and that question has to do with who we have here today. We know that 74% of you guys are offering bank products to your customers. So let's see what percentage of those tax clients are actually taking on the refund transfer products. So let me go ahead and launch that polling question. We'll leave it up for just 30 seconds or so. And we'll display the results for everybody to see. All right, so let's close the poll. I'm going to share the results here on screen. As you can see, 41% 1 to 30 of their tax clients have a bank product, a refund transfer, 21% between 31 and 50% of their clients, and then 9% 51 to 70. Uh, surprisingly, 12% over 70% of their tax clients. So let's dig in a little bit more on why this is a win-win for both our taxpayers and our tax preparers. And I, I think for this round, why don't we get started a little bit with Eric from TPG on the different types of bank products available. Sure, and, and you have shown there in the bullet points, the two main uh, offerings that, that the banks offer, obviously the refund transfer, where we're taking the, the, the tax prep and, and other fees out of the, the refund. Uh, on behalf of the taxpayer, the, the pre-act advance and the post-act advance loans uh, are, are also both big products for, for the last few seasons where the client can get an advance on what their expected refund is. In, in most cases, these are, are low cost, no recourse advances for the taxpayer. 
and it allows them to be able to put some immediate cash in their pocket within a few hours of, of filing the return, uh, if not sooner. And uh, helps with retention. It helps to be able to market those products to your clients and bring them into the door. And Eric, can you shed a little light on how the pre act the, the advanced loans are different than what what we've had in the in the past relative to uh, comparing to the, the refund anticipation loans of the past. What's different to highlight for this audience? Sure. Well, his, historically, the the refund advance loans, you know, that all took place after the acknowledgement of the IRS uh, for that refund. Uh, these pre act advances are are made outside of that acknowledgement, so they're much quicker. They're typically a, typically a smaller dollar amount. In our polling, our taxpayers uh, don't show the immediate need for their full refund immediately. So we'll have we'll offer a portion of what they're expecting as a, a pre-ac. And uh, like I said, you can get it in a lot of cases within minutes of transmitting that file to us rather than having to wait for the IRS to open up. As we saw this year, it was the latest start to the filing season that we've we've ever experienced. And if people are coming into your office January 10th and the filing season is not going to start till mid-February, they need uh, some, some cash immediately. This bridges that gap, uh, offers them some, uh, capital right away so they don't have to wait. Not only is, you know, is the IRS not going to accept that return till, till mid-February, but then you're looking at not even get, getting it funded for a couple of weeks after that. So if they're relying on their tax refund to pay bills immediately, rather than wait till the end of February, they have the availability to capital pretty much immediately. So we highlight, you highlighted there clearly the difference between pre-acknowledgement by IRS, but fair to say that advances are also available after once the IRS opens and acknowledgements begin flowing. This year obviously was very different with the late start, but in a traditional season, we would see pre-act just helps you kind of bring those people in that are ready to file early and get them, get their return into the stockpile so it's ready to process as soon as e-file is opened and then they continue uh, the advance loans continue once IRS is open and processing acknowledgements as well. Absolutely yeah, yeah. The, the offering will continue we just had a longer pre-act season this year than, than uh, we ever had before. I think one of the key differences is the non-recourse opportunities with this it's like helping people get the money that they need to get over that hump after Christmas and also that there's a little more flexibility, a lot more flexibility in the amount of advance that you're choosing. And it's interesting at the distinction that we see taxpayers choosing what they need as enough for the interim and not this full refund that we used to see many years ago. Sorry, go ahead, Carter. No, you actually said most of it in, in a really short snippet. Non-recourse is really one of the things that separates it from the RAL and the APR being more controlled than what it was in the past is what kind of uh, contrast the row of yesterday to the advance of today, but you, you guys said it great. I would just add to that, Shannon, that research shows that the consumer would rather have a, a smaller loan for a lesser cost versus a bigger loan for bigger cost. We saw that 25% of people elected less of a loan amount than what they were allocated actually eligible for so that would support you know the statistical data as well if you're eligible for this but you choose this it's just about the access to capital that you need at that time carter jermaine you both just chimed in a little bit i'll, I'll go jermaine first if there's something else you want to offer relative to this slide on payments types of other benefits that the partners receive so at the end of the day we are really as it relates to a, re, you know, we started out doing a refund advance loan, a refund anticipation loans, those are the old thing. Um, so even though the product has migrated to the advanced loans, which are certainly more consumer friendly, it still lets you know at the end of the day, we're bankers, we're lenders. As it relates to the refund transfer, we're not even lenders in that space. We're really just movers of money. Um, and so once you, once you kind of simplify those things, uh, Shannon, you start to realize, okay, what what else can we do outside of this? Well, the, the tax office is, you know, they're getting, uh, like I mentioned before, they're getting cash payments, they're getting checks and all these other things. But one of the things that they're getting is, uh, is 
uh, they're, they're getting credit cards and debit cards in order to pay for their credit fees. So many in the market also offer uh, credit card processing, um, which allows for an opportunity. And I will say, I think that the market, me personally, I think the market will ultimately grow to a place where we're able to supply many more of the financial needs of a tax office. And while there's nothing right now that we can do for things like cash, what I will say is we do things like uh, we give offices uh, preseason uh, loans. And what this helps them do is helps them get to tax season. Uh, so if you need new computers, or in some cases we do things like uh, uh, prepaid cards that we give to the office for referral bonus, um, or we, you know, if you're doing refund transfers, let's not forget that the IRS refund, which funds your prep fees, doesn't come. And specifically, if you have a huge percent of your, of your of your customers that are earned income tax credit, you're not getting those funds till late February, maybe early March. We advance those fees. So we are doing tons of things here to help the office to be as financially stable as possible. We do it at a super low cost. We do things like Eric mentioned that we help you with your marketing. He mentioned print. And what he didn't tell you is that we also do things to help you with your social media site. We also promote the different webinars that we're on. At the end of the day, we know that our interest cannot be just to increase our T-counts. We have to help you grow your business. We have to have an interest in your business growing because ultimately that will help us be more profitable as what we consider partners. What we consider partners. We don't even consider ourselves your bank. We're your partners and we're in this together. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Carter, you want to finish us off on this one? You have something to add on the bottom two bullets there? Well, so uh, first and foremost, there's there's kind of a, a prevalent trend that I think is important to talk about that for years now, I've talked to a lot of offices where they're great tax preparers with respects to preparing the return, knowing the forms to use, uh, what situations provide for this disallowance or this exception, where they flow, they know that. But the business aspect of running a tax office is often where they seek our advice. They, they may be good with doing the taxes. Uh, they definitely have a psychological component in dealing with individuals, but the business and running it in a, in, a, in a flow that allows them to accommodate their customers efficiently and in a timely fashion is challenging. One of the things that's always, I notice we have 26% that don't do bank products here on, on the webinar. They feel that the bank product process is challenging, not necessarily enrollment, but how they offer a product to the taxpayer. And once they've gone through it and kind of been schooled, they realize how easy it is. We've talked about how enrollment is no obligation, very simple to have that solution. But we haven't talked about the process for you know, offering the product and, and presenting that to them, which I think Lewis is going to go earlier, uh, later in four to five to 14 minutes is literally how fast you can do a bank product for a taxpayer that's performed from the previous year. That process and providing those disclosures and getting them signed off and off in queue to transmit and waiting for them to fund is so much more simple than coming in and having them go through to then try to negotiate a lower price for your fee or have them try to come back and pay you later for the service that you're providing today. You really want to close the book on this client and move on. And that happens a lot in peak. Uh, we've seen that taxpayers are coming in later uh, as well. I mean, indicative of this season more than others for a variety of reasons. So the, the process for getting your fee is much simpler in offering bank products for whatever process you use, whether it's the merchant services, direct debiting the account, the RT. It's just very easy for you to do, and there's some assurance in that I put that to rest and move it on. You know, Eric had talked about the accounts receivables. Back in the day, they literally used to have a list of clients in an Excel spreadsheet that owed them money that they were working against the balance. Now they still have the report for who owes, but it's based on funding. Again, I can't encourage enough the use of electing state bank products when a state refund is available to you because that's your second chance to get paid. And then the marketing support. Uh, if you're a great tax repair, it doesn't mean you know how to market yourself well. We all provide tools to help you find out how you perform in your particular area, where you fall in the pecking order, who tends to have more clients than you do and what's successful for them. But you really need to invest that time to understand the need to utilize 
the marketing support we provide, all in English and Spanish for all of us, to help get your message out there sooner. People just need right. to understand that we have these tools to help you. The process is easy, and we are happy to help you with beyond just, hey, why did this return not fund? Or what is it you see with this taxpayer? We help you get your business to where you need because we possess those skills to help you move across that line and grow your business, as Jermaine said. Great points. And you're right. We are going to cover a little bit more around how to get creative in marketing because we all need to be more creative in how we capture people's attention in this instantaneous society we live in today. So we'll just keep going here and talk a little bit about this tax season, which I think for many of us really felt like 2020, 2021, just all kind of rolled together and it became the tax season that never ended until May of this year. So now while we see the country opening back up and um, we have vaccines in full force, um, let's hope we get back to whatever our new normal is going to look like and how that's going to evolve over the course of the changes that we now see on the horizon uh, in the tax and regulatory world going forward. Eric, I think you're first up on this one. What would you say or lend around how the volume shifted a bit this year from um, the do-it-yourself space to to the tax uh, preparer space? Well. I we might not uh, always love change, especially when it comes in the tax code, but one of the things that it does typically do is is helps in the pro space. Uh, the more changes, uh, especially if they're late in coming in the season uh, or even during the season, uh, it, it just lends itself to confusion on the taxpayer side. They, they may not feel as confident that they could go to a, a do-it-yourself site and still be able to capture all the credits that are available to them it's near impossible to really stay up on top of all those changes. And so they're, it's going to drive more people from attempting to figure out their own taxes to in, into the professional office where they know that there's knowledge, that the software supports all the changes, that, that it helps to ensure that they're not going to leave any credits or money on the table. So, you know, I, I think anytime you see the, the magnitude of of changes and, and again late in the season changes it, it definitely helps drive more people there's more opportunities then for the professionals to to be able to capture new market share definitely i i completely agree with you i think that the the regulatory environment this year and the way that the changes were first passed and then well congress always has the best intentions of of helping they then put out legislation that has to then be evaluated and guidance given from the IRS perspective on how to implement whatever was in said bill. And so uh, in all my years in industry, this absolutely was a year of, of firsts in terms of the IRS having to really catch up with that regulatory environment so that we could have the guidance interpreted and implement because we don't want to make a mistake for our tax pros. We don't want to get it wrong. And when we don't have guidance, we can't do that, but the news was ahead of us, so the media had it. We were It was just uh, all of that uncertainty. I think of a lot of people not knowing when to file, how long should I wait? Is this the last thing to drop? What's coming next? It, it was a bit crazy for sure. Carter, how about the stimulus payments? How did that impact this, this filing season and, and maybe taxpayer behavior? So I was trying to think of the best analogy uh, over the past couple of days, and I think I arrived at Think of stimulus much like the stretching of a rubber band, and and that inherently that rubber band will will take somewhat similar shape. You know, the first stimulus went out last year. The second stimulus literally went out right at the time that we were all facilitating the pre-act loans, and then the third stimulus uh, went out much later. But three stimuluses having been received by taxpayers all within that period did have an impact on the bank product industry. I mean, uh, one of the things that we saw, um, and maybe not with the loans that carried no cost, uh, Jermaine or Eric could uh, speak to that probably better, but where there was uh, the higher election of loans and, and a fee, taxpayers actually had more capital at a time where normally they were hungry to get in the office as fast as they could to get their loan. That money did sustain more to not elect as many loans this season and in turn pay for pairs up front. That is not long standing. That that rubber band will reform because that money ultimately doesn't carry on for that long. It has been a very rough time. Employment is at all time high. So 
It did have a material impact in the way that affected the election of products, but it also had an impact on the perception of taxpayers for uh, the funding of their return, the uh, claiming of the recovery rebate credit. Uh, the amount of returns that are outstanding because the IRS, and I, I really like the way you put this, Shannon, it was done with the best intention, but in the learning of the first, there were a lot of things that came about in real time associated with the ultimate bank account and things that made it very challenging to deliver to taxpayers' expectations. And honestly, us as industry professionals, our expectations as well. Look, I guess it's an opportune time. I would just say, while well, there were... There were mistakes made in the process, especially in the early on phases of the EIP process. I'd have to, I, I try to take this opportunity just to say thank you to the folks at the IRS for actually convening with industry and working. I can't tell you the number of folks that were on the phone on Good Friday, on Easter Sunday, working through that first round of, of issues. It was a painful, painful process for a lot of the teams at the IRS and they were gifted a lot of this and didn't have much time to plan. And they're going to be in another situation with this advanced um, child tax credit coming up here in the next couple of weeks. It's a lot on the service. And um, I just commend those folks for, for working through it. It's a bumpy ride, but they're they're in it for the long haul. Like I tell you, they're committed. I think I we've say been, this season I gained a whole new respect for. Them. Yeah. Whole yeah. Same here. Same here. Oh, I always have had, but it was above and beyond anything I've ever seen. So. Jermaine, why don't you go ahead and explain? I think some folks are probably reading increased walk-in and going, what, what are you talking about there? So, you know, it's, it's funny uh, because Eric literally just started talking about how generally by nature, we don't really like change, but sometimes uh, we're forced into change. And so this season, the one thing, you know, we were all telling our tax offices all fall was, look, you have to get prepared to be able to deal with your customers in a remote fashion because we didn't know the social distancing rules, how many people you could have inside your office. The only and we didn't know how long it would last. The only thing that I knew was you will not have 20 people in your lobby waiting to be seen. That's the only thing I knew about how tax season would work. And what happened was many of our offices began to get their customers' data uh, kind of remotely. Hey, it's just a drop-off rather than you having to, in the 20-minute conversation that you would have with your customer about their kids, even before you started, might happen over a Zoom call. And so what this, what ultimately happened out of this, Shannon, um, is that those offices that were effectively able to minimize the face-to-face -face interaction with their returning customers, had emptier lobbies to be able to see new customers. What you don't want is a customer, a potential customer who, who needs their taxes done, want to come to you and then think, now oh, that's a crowded office, let me go to the guy next door. And by being able to use the different remote tools that are available to you, and I'm sure Shannon, you're gonna go a little bit more there on e-signature capture and all that other good stuff. But what it does is it allows you to be able to affect, who knows how many returns you can handle in the back office once the door closes. But if your office is open during the day, it allows you to be able to increase the number of new customers that you wanna see. Uh, that is fantastic point. Fantastic point. And so that you're sort of looking at the flip side of this and what does the opportunity come from in these, these, the silver linings of COVID, I'd like to call them, or the silver linings of our pandemic situation is not COVID uh, clearly, but what opportunities we can uncover there. And when I think about the biggest impact or change relative to remote tax, relative to what's happened in our uh, remote work environments and everybody kind of locking down the opportunity for remote tax preparation and the adoption, frankly, of the online tools, the, the, the acceptance that adoption of cloud is simply where you have to go for the future because it is managing infrastructure and hardware is getting more and more difficult and what's possible on those tools in that um, older technology stacks is very difficult. And what we can do, the nimbleness of the work product, I saw a lot of tax pros saying, I have to have the online presence because I'm gonna need to be working later in the evening. They had spouses working from home. We know many tax preparers have uh, do it as a second job. That may be just the seasonal approach to tax prep. 
And they needed that flexibility now more than ever as they were uh, helping kids get through school or you know, supporting the, the children while another spouse is working. So the flexibility was just across the board in so many different ways and impacted many different businesses in different ways. But what we saw in cloud adoption, electronic signatures, mobile to be able to just capture exactly what you said, that returning client, nothing much changed. I can carry forward that data. You verify it with them. You can do it digitally, get that signature and you're done and on to the next person. So that I think was the, the biggest impact of 2020 and what's going to, to what's going to continue on in how we approach this going forward. It, you know, and it's funny, Shannon, because just like here in corporate America, how we're all reassessing work from home versus work inside the office, like many of our clients may not be going back to the office full time. So what you may find customers that do want to come back and sit down and have that 20 minute conversation with you for that customer. That's great. But I would also imagine that generally speaking, we're not going to go back to 2019. We have found a new way of doing business. Yeah, you're right. And I think we all have to accept that we got a lot to work through in the next couple, the coming year and years to figure out what that new hybrid approach looks like and how we, the process of getting back to whatever new normal we have, how it all plays out. Absolutely. And let's see if we can get it working this time around. The poll is, when do you typically submit your bank product enrollment application? Of course, for those of you who are preparing bank product returns, do you submit your application as soon as it opens, enrollment, or do you wait until November, December, January? Hopefully not many. Or, you know, of course, maybe you did not offer bank products this year and you do not know. Uh, we'll give everybody a couple of seconds. Where do you think, Shannon and, and team, that the numbers are going to fall? I know exactly where this is going to fall. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, is, there is not a doubt. I would love to change it. Uh, but uh, January will probably be 40%. December will probably be 30%, uh, maybe even 35%. Uh, other than, I'm sorry, we have to take out whatever percentage it is but did not uh, offer bank products. We need people to begin to enroll earlier. but the bulk of people enroll in December, January. So let's go ahead and share. As soon you as know what? Open, I think I we're also so I glad. love these people on the line. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm yeah. Give them my cell phone number. And so with that, I think we can move on. And you know, one of the things that we wanted to 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 make sure we mentioned in the next slide is early enrollment. It's a big deal. But let's start from the beginning of the year with tax season. Certainly, and uh, we, we've talked about this earlier uh, as well, but, uh, you know, leading up to the tax season, you know, we, we offer different tools uh, and, and capital options for, for people who might need uh, some, some early capital prior to getting their fees. So, so we do offer that leading up to tax season. The fee collection out of pay by refund is, is very simple. It's, it's very in line in the, the tax software. So it's, it's a convenience for your client. It also offers the direct deposit option for people who may not have an account that, that, that they can get their tax refund sent to, or they, they may not want the refund sent to their, the bank that they usually use for one reason or another. So this is, offers those options uh, so they can still get the direct deposit, don't have to pay, pay your fees up front. And like we said earlier, you can advertise this in, in many different ways. Uh, we all have advertising folks on staff that produce some really good things for you to be able to use. And that's how you're going to attract those clients and, and keep them. Uh, it's going to be a good experience for your office. It's going to be a good experience for your taxpayer. Uh, it's going to keep them coming back because it's easy. Absolutely. I'll go to the Q2 activities you should be doing from as far as growing your business and um, flip it over to Carter. So keep in mind, it's different strokes for different folks. If you are happy with the niche that you carved out, the volume of your business, your retention is high, then for you, you're really just identifying at-risk clients and doing the continuing education training. But for those of you trying to grow your business or necessarily attract a different type of client, you really need to evaluate your tax fees and performance along the lines of where most of your clients are coming from, how they heard about you, you know, your new clients, and what is it in particular for your pre-existing clients that has you coming back? Sometimes it's the relationship, it's the cost associated with the service provided, 
it's the speediness and timeliness in which you can deliver their experience. But for those trying to grow, far too often what happens is, is in their off season, pretty much at the time June rolls around, they're planning on vacation and they don't resurface to reevaluate renewing their software and enrolling with their bank until right before the season begins. And they really need to be looking at their average fee per taxpayer, just a variety of circumstances associated with what is your core client and the value there, and specifically the ones that have given you the impression that they wouldn't come back and for what reason. Sometimes a client come, won't come back because of something you weren't willing to do that you shouldn't do. That's fine, but there are other things that have to do with your front office personnel. A lot of times we hire new staff uh, for season. We don't have returning employees ourselves. This occurs in tax offices. And you sometimes have to triage from you have an actual hole in your office with an individual that may be fine at tax preparation, but isn't very personable in interacting with the client. So you really need to be looking at what it is that you're offering, how it is that you're doing this. A, a lot of it associated with uh, the tools that you're using along the lines of what kind of Shannon and Jermaine said earlier. Back before, you know, increasing your digital pro footprint and using these tools was an option. COVID taught us that it wasn't an option. And so now is the best time to go into that to say, okay, if I can only hire one or two people and we can only do a maximum of 500 returns between us and I anticipate getting 750, you don't necessarily have to be considering about where you're hiring the next employee. You can be looking at how you can be more efficient to do that amount of business with the people you have and the tools you have. You know, sending out the client organizer in advance to get that information so you're actually ready to prepare the return by the time they come in and not just gathering all the information there. Sending out the link from the TaxWise mobile app that gathers the information to have that. So when they sit down, it eliminates the amount of time that you're spending in interacting to do that. Making sure to send out the birthday notices, uh, the things that they told you that they don't know that you remember to the clients that you've had each year because then it's showing some level of personalization. I just think that people don't concentrate on their off-season activities enough to really focus on where they can grow and improve their business. Well, I think in, in conjunction with that, you've got to do some evaluation of what kind of options you have available to you, right? So how's your existing practice working? What does your pricing look like relative to competitors? Have you gone out and price shopped what's going on in your in your local area, in your neighborhood, wherever your reach or your scope of, of business is, have you effectively evaluated that? And if you are in a growth mode, and are you engaging in the things in that future generations are engaging in. We talked a little bit, a very little bit about social media and how do we leverage that? I think that if you're not there today, you're missing a huge opportunity because that is where people are getting, this is where people sell. This is where they're getting, they're catching those eyeballs I keep referring to by engaging in social marketing, whether it's Facebook, whether it's um, subject matter expertise through Twitter. And LinkedIn is not as much of, I think, a um, it's a thought leadership platform for sure, but not as much from a garnering um, business. But Facebook for sure is. I think Instagram is definitely is also in that in in that genre. It depends on the demographic of the again the audience for you and your tax office. But that's how you combat the big franchises by staying local. Get involved with you have a local newspaper, a local magazine, or homeowners associations, schools, churches, any of those things. And I say, I throw all of them out. And I sometimes, when we're in person and I can actually read an audience, people kind of go, okay, that's a lot. And they're writing down frantically, just pick one, right? Just choose one that works for you. If you're in with the sports team things, then you can go all in on that. If not, find a different avenue, one that works for you, fits your business, fits your neighborhood. And then finally, I think you have to look at the, the partner services that you have available. Um, Look at your tax software, look within and ask your sales rep here, ask your bank partners uh, what what else is available, what else could you be leveraging that might work well, and find that solution that best fits, again, your office. Eric, finally, when it comes into, uh, I'm sorry, Jermaine, when it comes to early enrollment, when we get into that Q4, what should offices be looking for? This is what I will say as it relates to, to early enrollment. As Carter was talking, he made reference to uh, what tax offices are doing when it's not tax season. 
there is a certain percentage that we all have of uh, what I'll consider for the sake of this conversation, non-returning customers, which means if you have 100, let's assume, let's assume you're a great office and 95 customers, 95% uh, of your customers return, which by, a way, by the way is generally speaking an unrealistic number. But for the sake of this conversation, we'll use it. That still means before you get back to last year's profitability, your job is to replace those five customers. And so for, uh, for businesses that, and many of you may have other businesses as well, and so I get that part, but for businesses who completely take the summer and fall off um, because it's not tax season, I'll worry about that down the line. To me, you're doing your business a disservice. You need to be doing things like what Shannon just mentioned, which was, your annual review of your partner services. You know, if you're using Joe's tax software and last year you paid X dollars for it, you wanna make sure that Joe's tax software is still a good value for your dollar. And you wanna evaluate, and maybe maybe it's worth it to stay, maybe it's going up a few dollars. Well, guess what? If it went up a few dollars, that may mean your costs need to go up a few dollars. You need to figure out what is best for you. When, and then once you make that decision, you know, some of our best months best months for enrollment on the bank side, uh, sales on the software side is January. You need to have had made that decision long before January. You should be making that decision at least September, October, because you need to be ready to roll to understand what it is that you're going to be offering to your consumers. And here's the biggest part. One thing that never changes, and you always have to explain to people who are new to the business, the one thing that never changes is the date the IRS start, you still have to be ready. No matter when that date is, we like we can't start a tax season four days later than the IRS uh, opens. We'll all be out of business. We need to be ready on the date that the IRS starts. Um, so that's kind of a consistent for us. And you kind of need to look at it that way as well. So Luis, I wanna, I'm gonna turn it over to you to kind of wrap this up. Yeah, absolutely, Shannon. And really the last thing we wanted to do was to spend a couple of minutes showing how a bank product can be selected in a tax return. And I'm gonna share my monitor real quick and show you how in the tax software, all you have to do is really you know, select the bank product uh, of your choice and then start the return. So I'm actually gonna show it in our TaxWise online which as we can see is browser-based, so I'm not installing anything. I can access it from my laptop. I can access it from my tablet, from my smartphone. The software will be the same as if you know I'm on my computer. And I actually have the ability to log into any year. All I have to do is to change it from 19 to 20 to 18, 17. I have all years available to me. And when I log into the solution, I go to my tax returns tab, then I open a tax return. And for those of you familiar with TaxWise, you know that in the main information sheet, and it will be similar to the solution of your choice, in the main information form or in a primary form somewhere, you will be asked whether this return is an e-file return, whether it's a bank product or a paper return. And that's the case for us. So it's really simply all you do is you select a bank product, as you can see, we then have the option to select our bank product partner. For this example, I'll just go ahead and choose Republic. The bank forms will automatically load. On the left-hand side, there is a bank use and bank disclose form, and then you have the actual bank product application that you'll have to fill out. Now, information will not populate as far as refund for the refund transfer until you actually say that you are disclosing information and you're using the bank product. But as soon as you do that, you'll see those amounts right there. So it's very easy. And of course, it's available to you in a pay per use basis, as all of you have mentioned today. So if you do one, then your customer only pays for the one. You know, If you don't do any, then that's okay. You still want to enroll. Uh, because it may facilitate that growth that we're all looking for. So that's how simple you can choose a bank product. This is our TaxWise online solution. As you can see, everything is right there, what you would expect it. Forms on the right-hand side, refund monitor on the left-hand side, forms tree color-coded on the left-hand side as well. And you know, as important as it has become over the past couple of seasons, it is a browser-based solution. So I can take it with me anywhere because I can access it very 
easily from a web browser. So that is all for us today. I appreciate your time. And I'm going to leave you, everybody, with a last polling question. And that is, would you like to learn more about any of the solutions that we talked about today? You just uh, saw TaxWise online for a couple of minutes. So check that if you would like for us to send you some information about it. TPG, Refund Advantage, EPS, Republic Bank, we're all represented today. If you want everybody to give you a call, check them all. That's okay as well. <laughs> but expect a follow-up email, expect a follow-up call just to check in and see what you thought of the presentation, anything that we missed, anything that you particularly liked. Uh, and then of course, you know, an opportunity for us to show you what we're all about. As Shannon mentioned, it's a win-win. You either evaluate what other partners can offer, you confirm you're in the right place, or you find something that better fits your needs. And that's all that we all ask of you. So thank you everybody for joining us. I'm gonna close the poll right now. And uh, once again, Shannon, Carter, Jermaine, Eric, great session. We'll see you next time. Thank, thank you, you all. Everybody. Thanks everybody. Take care.